All right, so this week on topic eight, and we've only got three topics to go, or two topics to go, actually. I think two topics to go, um, and then we'll have a summary week. Today we're going to look at planning out the audit and the actual design of procedures. So we've done a little bit around design. We've done a little bit around assertions and controls. Today we're going to draw it all together, and there's going to be a number of different exercises um, that I'm going to do live with input from you guys. Okay? So the sorts of, oh, let's start with our concept map. I realized last week I didn't draw a concept map and I felt really bad for not doing that. So let's start with what we know. We know that there's an audit report that goes out. All right. I know that I need evidence to be able to generate my audit report and that I'm looking for misstatements. But those misstatements need to be the material ones. All right, so I'm looking for material misstatements. Now, to generate my evidence, I need to, before I can do that, actually understand the client. All right, and understanding the client requires me to make two particular assessments. It requires me to make an assessment on inherent risk and it requires me to make an assessment of control risk. Okay, now to assess my control risk, I need to think about my control risk pyramid or my internal control pyramid, which has my control environment, it has my risk assessment, it has my control activities, It has my information systems, and it has monitoring. All right, let's just make that a bit the right size. Okay. And then I know all of that feeds into the audit risk model. Okay, so let me just start drawing some lines of things. Okay. So we've got our audit report. I'm just going to shrink some of these. Oh, undo. Shrink some of these things down so that I've got enough room. OK, I've got my audit report. It's my document. And that, no, oh, bummer. I've done something wrong. That requires me to collect audit evidence. All right. My evidence, I'm looking for misstatements and that must be material misstatements. Oh, to determine what my misstatements are, I need to think about my assertions. And remember, I've got different types of assertions. So that's how I figure out if I've got a misstatement or not. My assertion will tell me so. And my assertions are, what are my transaction assertions? Occurrence. Occurrence. Accuracy. I heard somebody say completeness. What else? Cut off and now let's see one. Cl classification. All right. So I've got my assertions there for my transactions. And then I also have my assertions for my balances, which are? Existence, valuation. valuation and allocation, whoops, completeness, completeness. Rights, and rights and obligations. All right. Okay, well, let's move some things around so I can fit that all in. Okay. So, uh, for my assertions, I'm thinking about feeding in those two pieces of information uh, there to determine whether I've got a material misstatement. Now, to figure out how I'm going to collect my evidence, I need to use my audit risk model to help develop my audit strategy. Okay, and we know that we've got a couple of different strategy types, but my audit strategy helps me decide how I'm going to get my evidence. My audit risk model comes from inherent risk, Control risk, those things feed into control risk. And 
It is the detection risk that gives me my audit strategy. What are my two types of strategies? Or three types, really. Substantive, controls-based, and mixed, which is a combination of the two. All right, so my audit strategy is going to be one of these, or a combination of those, to be able to go and generate audit evidence. And I have to understand the client, whoops. So understanding the client, <coughs> helps me figure out my inherent risk and my control risk. So today, we're going to tackle the idea of the audit program, all right, which is going to be our specific set of instructions to collect the evidence. And that's going to be related to our audit strategy. It's going to be related to what we think are the inherent risks and the control risks at the client. All right. So my program is my recipe for going out and gathering evidence. Recipe. Okay. And like recipes, nothing, uh, no two recipes are often the same. I'm just going to quickly save. Okay, so now that I've given you the concept map for this week of where we're going, let's look at what our objectives are. So we're going to look at different types of audit tests, knowing when to select the appropriate ones. We're going to look at how IT affects um, the, uh, the uh, audit testing, what sort of mix of evidence we want to look at. We're going to look at designing an audit program. I've actually deleted that one out of today's slides because that's uh, less important. Uh, the phases of the audit process, which we're going to look at as well. And then at the end, we're going to do some practical. All right. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing lots of practical things within our lectures. All right. So what are the different types of audit tests? Risk assessment, which is about getting to know the company, testing the internal controls. And what we're looking for when we're testing the internal controls is we're saying, are the controls operating as designed. All right, because when we make our control risk assessment originally, we say, oh, if control risk is low, we think controls are well designed. When we're looking at the flow charts of the company, that part is all about evaluating design. Then we need to test, are they operating as they were designed? Because right, plenty of times you might have a control that doesn't work as it's supposed to. Uh, we have substantive tests, and there's three different types. Testing individual transactions, doing analytical procedures, and then testing just the balances at the end. And we do a combination of those three tests to gather our sufficient and appropriate evidence. Right? Remember, ASA 500 says that I must go out and I must collect sufficient and appropriate evidence. Sufficient and appropriate. Okay, we're going to look at today what is appropriate. Next week, we're going to look at how do I know how much is sufficient? How much is enough evidence to be able to support my audit opinion that I have to give under ASA 700? So what do I do when I do risk assessment? ASA 315 is one of our key standards because it requires us to understand the entity, including the environment, internal controls, and how they assess risk, because that's manager's job. Right? Part of manager's role is to minimize risk. So managers are trying to minimize risk that may affect the company's goals. All right. Oops, I don't want the question mark. Okay. So a manager's job is to minimize risk, react, or be proactive to things that could affect the organization's objectives. And we looked at identifying business risks earlier on as those things managers are worried about. They're worried about competition, they're worried about a supplier maybe going out of business, they're worried about production efficiency or wastage, theft from employees. So they need a process to minimize the risk that all of those things could occur 
and impact achieving the goals of shareholders, which is generally achieving some level of profit or dividend. So the client, sorry, the auditor, needs to look at what risk assessment procedures managers within the organisation do. Obviously, in fast-paced industries like technology um, and medical science, they probably do risk assessment a lot more frequently than a company that might hand make furniture. Right? If you're custom making uh, handmade furniture, then your industry is probably changing a lot slower than if you're in financial markets, mergers and acquisitions, etc. So this comes from figure 11.1 .1 out of your textbook, and I've added this bit here. And this is our audit risk model, all right? So the audit risk, remember, is the, the risk that the partner is willing to accept that they give the wrong opinion. If control risk is, and let me write this down here in pen, if control risk is low or medium, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to test those controls. Are they operating as they were designed? All right. Now, if I was doing this at Sydney Trains, what sort of controls exist at Central Station? Gates, all right, and our Opal cards. And so what is supposed to happen? You take your Opal card, as long as there's a balance or money on your Opal card and you tap it, it should let you out of the train station. Okay? So if I was testing whether that control was operating effectively, I'd also look at, well, what other things could I try and tap to see if it does or doesn't work? So I could try my Medicare card. I could try my staff ID from UTS. The other day, and I, I live out near um, Quakers Hill, and there is a really fantastic um, Indian place out there called Maharaja's Haveli. And you get, if you like Indian food as much as I do, you could buy a little membership card, which for a certain amount of year gives you discounts. And I had that card in my pocket, I pulled it out, and I tapped on the thing. I'm like, why is the gate not opening? And I'm like, oh, it's because my food, it's my food discount card. Put that away, get my actual Opal card out. So we want to make sure the controls are operating as they were designed, and they were operating as they were designed for the entire year. All right. Because the controls have been doing their thing every single day over the entire financial period. So I want to know, are there any days or months or small periods of hours where the control wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing? Why am I looking for any periods in which the control wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing? Yes. Because if there is an instance where a control does break down, it poses a greater risk of material misstatement. And if I do find a, a spot where it's not working, that's sort of like having radar that says, this is the first place we're going to look. Okay? This is just like in those crime shows where you know, they find people dead in a house and then they find that the back door has been busted in and they go, ah, oh, okay, this was the point of entry. Let's follow the crime and see if we can retrace what happened from that particular point. So unfortunately, you know, fortunately, there's no dead bodies in auditing that we know about. Um, but we do want to find out those particular points in time because they could be indicators. I'm also going to do substantive tests of individual transactions. Are my debits and credits backed up by all my documentation? Or do my documentation tell a different story? All right. Here we do lots of vouching, tracing, and recalculating, inspecting documents. We also use some analytical procedures, and sometimes these are used before we do the substantive tests. Um, so I might use ratio analysis to pinpoint which accounts might be at higher risk of material misstatement. I might, if I'm worried about inventory being obsolete, I might calculate inventory turnover by product line. And for any product line that is moving less than, say, one, less than one of turnover in that year, I might say, okay, I'm going to investigate those specifically to make sure that they're real inventory that could be resold, rather than check thousands and thousands and thousands of products. Um, in small companies, it's not such a big deal, but when you get to big ones like Woolworths, Unilever, Coca-Cola, the amount of inventory is pretty, pretty huge. 
And then we also test balances. So that sort of links through with our transactions in a way. We say, do all the transactions for sales add up to the balance of sales? All right. So often tests of balances around transactions are mathematical checks. So you know, let's test everything that's in here adds up to this number here. But then sometimes you might have some balances like accounts receivable, where instead of testing all the individual sales and cash payments that went into that balance, I'm just going to test the final amount. All right. So all of these sorts of tests in different mixes come up with sufficient and appropriate evidence under ASA 500 paragraph 5. I'm pretty sure it's paragraph 5. So I might be wrong. So this mix is different. Um, have I told you guys the fried rice story? Yeah, I think I might have to some people. Has anybody not heard the fried rice story? Some people are like, what, what is she talking about? So these are our ingredients for sufficient and appropriate evidence. All right. And we could, you can make it chocolate cake or cupcakes or whatever you like, but I always use the fried rice story because um, I'm Asian, obviously. And um, it's sort of a funny thing that my aunties do. They always make fried rice. Everybody makes fried rice for every family get-together that we have. And it seems stupid that we have, you know, six pots of fried rice, but it's just the way it happens. And they're always comparing each other. They're all tasty. They're all sufficient and appropriate at the end, but they've got different mixes of ingredients. So when you guys get on to designing audit procedures coming up, don't worry if your audit procedures don't look like your friends or other people on your table in your tutorial. Because as long as it meets some particular rules, and I'm going to talk about my four rules for designing audit procedures a little bit later, then you'll be fine. All right? So as long as I think it gives me sufficient appropriate evidence at the end, I don't mind what this mix is. All right, so there's some examples of tests of controls, and we've done some uh, within our class today. Like if we're looking at different people doing different jobs, the shipping documents are done uh, daily. If you've been to a tutor already, you would have looked at you know, courier signatures um, or approvals on purchase orders as examples of tests of controls. And we'll do lots more practice ones of these. So substantive tests of transactions fall into those three categories, testing individual transactions, doing the analytics, or doing my tests of balances. So really, we could do any combination of those three depending on the account. So let me write down here, any combo of the three. All right. And that combination will be affected by the level of risk both inherent and control risk. It will depend on the sort of evidence that you can actually collect. All right, so you might have one particular client where the mix of these could be different between different years because the level of risk changes. So what are our analytical procedures? Our analytical procedures, and we've looked at this before, Comparisons and relationships. This is where we use our knowledge of debits and credits to tell me what looks unusual. All right, and that's usually the key, the key here. Oh, sick of writing with blue, let's change colors. Purple, okay. So I'm looking for stuff that looks unusual or out of place. Okay, if I'm looking for, if I'm at Woolworths uh, and I'm looking at inventory, I know that inventory needs to turn over fairly quickly if it's fresh food. I'm pretty sure if we didn't have turnover in whole chickens, for example, of you know, maybe 100, which means you're turning over stock every couple of days. If turnover for chickens was five, I'd be like, well, that's some really old chickens we're looking at here. Um, probably wouldn't sell those. But if I was looking at the Aston Martin dealership, so do we all know Aston Martin, the car brand? The car James Bond drives, yeah? very expensive, um, then if they had turnover of five, I'd be like, wow, that's fantastic. You know, that's like 20 cars sold here. I don't even think that many get shipped here in a year. Um, so I need to think about what am I looking at? What would be reasonable to expect given the product and the type of firm that we're looking for? So they are 
indicates, they indicate the presence of possible misstatements. Oh, that's terrible. Let me change that to green. The presence of possible misstatements. So they narrow down our search area, but they don't specifically say, this is the error. Right? These inventory items are obsolete, need to be written off, or have gone you know, past their expiry date. Um, typically, substantive, sorry, analytical procedures just give us an arrow of where to look. Sometimes, you might be able to rely on just analytical evidence for something that might be immaterial. So, for very small accounts, uh, we might use only analytical procedures, but it's very rare. Um, you'd always use your analytical, most of the time, for the stuff that you guys are going to be starting with, which is cash, accounts receivable, sales, if you go into an audit career. Um, you're always going to start with the APs to tell me what looks unusual. So you might do something like biggest customers. Which customers had the most sales? Which customers received the most discounts? Um, at a number of companies where, you know, you think about JB Hi-Fi, in some areas like big screen TVs or uh, high-end items, sales are made with commissions. All right? Um, and at a company that I audited many, many years ago, it doesn't exist anymore, um, they had sales based with commissions, but we thought, oh, look, there's a high number of sales, but we also have a high number of sales returns. And we actually graphed out sales by date, sales volumes by date, by salesperson, and then also overlaid on that sales returns. And we discovered that what some salespeople were doing was just before the end of the quarter, they would get their friends to come in and buy a whole lot of stuff. They would make big sales, receive a big commission, and then a week later, those people would return for a refund. So we could see that the sales were really being manipulated in that instance. So you can use all sorts of analytics. Um, you can graph stuff, map stuff out to try and indicate, well, what could be going wrong here? How is that wrong? Well, those salespeople were overinflating what they actually sold. You know, so they might get commissions, or they sold to real customers maybe 500 units. They get friends in to buy another 500. They receive commissions, but then the friends go and return the goods the next week for a cash refund. So the, they weren't really sold goods. The net sales ends up being very low. But the salespeople have manipulated the volume of sales based on how the uh, sales commission process worked at that particular company. It was monthly. So we saw in the last week leading up to the end of the month, big ramp up in sales. And then about a week after commissions were paid, all of those goods got returned. Well, they weren't really legitimate sales if the customer, if you're selling to your friends and they're going to return the goods, in, you know, they're intending to not ever keep the items and they're going to return them. So how do you distinguish between what's a legitimate customer? Because companies do have returns. You know, think about Target, Kmart, they all have a returns policy. But when returns start to get abnormally high or high for specific sales people, then that could be an indicator. You know, if you think that somebody at JB Hi-Fi is perhaps giving too many discounts or the discounts are excessive, then you can actually calculate that by individual salesperson if you think that something unusual is going on. Um, in testing our balances, uh, generally, uh, we want to make sure that for everything, all the individual transactions add up to the amount that's on the balance sheet and income statement, but we mostly do tests of balances for balance sheet items. All right, so accounts receivable, um, valuing land. So if you have land and buildings, All right, this is one of those prime accounts that's good for a test of detail of balance. I will write to the land valuer. Um, so land values are set centrally uh, in New South Wales. We would write to the office that handles land valuations and attain the latest land valuation to check the balance of that land, the value. Um, buildings might be a little bit more complicated because you certainly have wear and tear um, etc. But you could have items where you want to just confirm the end balance. Another common one there is your accounts receivable. Um, we talked about confirmations, um, how they can be a good or bad thing depending on the situation. 
Um, and then even inventory. We're looking at inventory items, but we're checking is the balance of item A, item B, item C correct? And then do all of items A through to Z add up to the total? So how do I know what the appropriate type of audit tests are to use? You need to figure out, well, there's some general rules here about if I'm testing controls, I'm going to be doing a lot of observing, inquiring, analytical procedures, obviously, you're going to do a lot of analytical procedures. And testing of transactions involves usually a lot of looking at documents, re-performing in terms of vouching and tracing and recalculating. The better way to think about it, let me just see if this is on the next slide. All right, it's not on the next slide, so I'm going to uh, add a little note here. The better way about thinking of which type of tests to perform is think about what assertions do I need to gather evidence on. All right, and once I've figured out what assertions I need to collect my evidence for, the procedure will be self-evident. So if I'm testing valuation, or I'm testing accuracy, I need to do some form of recalculation, usually. Right? If I want to check that something really exists or did occur, I'm going to need to do some form of vouching, which falls under reperformance. Right? If I'm checking that the company actually owns this piece of land, I'm going to look at a piece of documentation. So there is a table that gives you some ideas on what procedures to use. But if you really know what the assertions are about, you won't need this table here. Okay. And there's some um, videos in this week's folder, and I know that there's quite a lot of them, where I go through numerous different types of examples of different sorts of firms and designing different sorts of procedures for you to watch. Now, one of the things that we also have to consider is that we're doing the audit to try and make a profit or at least the partner is trying to make a profit. Um, you just earn your salary, unfortunately. But the audit partner is trying to make a profit off you. Um, and you, know, you don't get anywhere near the rate of money that you're charged out at. What are graduate accountant charge out rates? Does anybody know? Josh, what do you get charged out at? $360 an hour. Josh's work is worth $360 an hour. And I'm pretty sure you don't receive $360 worth. 15, yeah, 15 to 25 is probably uh, what we <laughs> start out at. So we have to think about cost. How much work are we going to do? How much is in the budget? And that's one of the things that the audit manager is always going to look after, which is the budget of how many hours can be spent on each time of the audit. Question? Bevan. Um, so the part, so Josh there is charged out at Hopefully, the, the average rate is about $360 an hour the client will pay for a relatively uh, junior auditor. Partners rates, I would guess, would be somewhere around $800 or more. So partners don't spend 35 hours a week on the audit. They might spend an hour here or there <coughs> reviewing stuff, but that's why we have lots of junior auditors to do all of the detailed work. Uh, well, you'd get a sal so what graduate starting salaries for big four firms are about fifty five thousand. So whatever that works out at an hour. So if you work you work about forty hours a week. So you could work backwards from that. So what's cheapest? Analytical procedures are cheapest because you just take data and you run some calculations on it, and that's relatively simple. Understanding the internal controls and risk is next because again, that's mostly just talking to people. Interviewing you can't interview people forever. But what gets more expensive is when, and these sort of, uh, these two would be the same, really. I, I know that I've got them one next to each other, but they're really the same. Testing internal controls, a lot of that can be done with IT and online, so that's quite reasonable um, to test. But these, looking at detailed transactions, journal entries, invoices, shipping documents, orders, Tracking down all that paperwork, checking that it all matches, is the relatively expensive part of the audit. All right. So this is all of that substantive work. Now, how are firms trying to cut costs on all of this substantive work? Outsourcing. 
Um, and not necessarily outsourcing to you know, another company they don't know, it's usually outsourcing to places like India, the Philippines, um, and that is often done overnight. The beauty with India um, and a lot of the, the call centers, or sorry, the uh, processing centers that are over in that part of the world is that they're on the opposite time zone to us. So we will scan a whole lot of journal entries, documents, etc., send it to the outsourcing group, um, usually somewhere in the subcontinent. They will work overnight and pay people way less than they pay you um, to document and check. And then the next morning, you have it back to make your decision. So while you know, traditionally, if I got someone like Josh to do all of these tests, it would be very expensive. Um, competitiveness has meant that we do have outsourcing. There are risks associated with this quality, who is supervising them when we first started outsourcing audit work um, across to different countries, the quality was terrible um, because there weren't policies and procedures in place. It's to the point now where most of the um, English speaking big four audit firms actually have you know, Australian and American and UK staff working in the outsourcing center supervising the work. And that's often a, dangled as a bit of a fast track to a promotion too. So if you want to get promoted quicker, then you'll do your six to 12 months um, somewhere in India supervising a whole lot of people doing basic audit work, which is not terribly exciting, but is an essential part of trying to make the process appropriate. Because as the audit partner, you're responsible for everybody who does work on the audit, even if you never meet them or you never see them. You are still personally responsible. So how do I know how, what to test in terms of internal controls and substantive? Um, where control risk is high, we don't test internal controls. High control risk is poor internal controls. It's like having a bucket with a big hole in it. I don't need to pour water into that bucket to know that it's going to leak. But if the bucket looks pretty good and it has maybe only a few tiny little pinprick holes, then I might still, I'm gonna test the bucket. So I wanna test the internal controls typically where control risk is low or medium. Okay, oh, what's wrong with my pen? There we go. Now, if control risk is low, my amount of control testing, control tests, are going to be higher than when they're in a medium situation, all right? Here, I'm only gonna test the controls that look like they're in place, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do substantive testing where I think there are weaknesses, all right, based on those gaps. And if everybody's seen my little uh, internal control video with the circles and that sort of thing, that should give you some uh, extra information there. Uh, I've already talked about analytical procedures before. Um, I mentioned that the key there is we're looking for things that are unusual and then give us direction to do more substantive testing. Um, if we think that everything looks good on the substantive procedures, we think that the likelihood is small, then I can do less substantive work. I might only do five or 10 transactions instead of doing 50 or 100. Um, and for small accounts, as I mentioned earlier, we might do just analytical procedures. And that's typically for things that are accounts that are smaller than materiality. Just do a save. All right, so here we just have a diagram again which shows that uh, where we've got greater internal controls, I'm going to do lots of control testing and some substantive testing, but less. And that's exactly the same, though it probably makes a bit more sense in this one here. Has everyone seen this video? Yes. If you haven't, and this week's tute work makes no sense at all, and is completely confusing, then this is the video for you that goes through uh, how we choose the amount of testing. All right, how does IT affect our audit testing? Well, in the old days, when we didn't have one computer per auditor and we had one per team, we still did lots of stuff on paper. And my very first job was depreciation recalculation. I got given a huge pile of paper from a dot matrix printer, so it wasn't even laser printers back then. This was zzz, 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 those line printers with the paper with the holes down the side. I was given that 
a calculator and a ruler and a pen and said, okay, you need to recalculate all of these depreciation calculations to make sure they're correct. You'd never do that now because you'd probably get some sort of spreadsheet and you'd use the auditing function or the auditing tools within Excel or you'd recreate the Excel spreadsheet to see if your version of the spreadsheet and the client's version of the spreadsheet did the same thing. Um, so IT has revolutionized audit testing and the years that we spent as junior auditors doing crappy grunt work um, of calculations and things has been minimized somewhat. Um, ASA 315 says we need to make sure that we understand what IT systems are in the client. We may use specialized audit programs to test the computer system, um, but we do need to know, you know how, what sort of controls are there on computer access. Who knows you know, passwords to access certain information? How often are backups run? And usually we will get information about that. So they'll give us reports that say, here's our security logs, or here's the num reports of you know number of times that someone's tried to hack the CEO's um, email account. But in most of the big four firms, you will have an expert. And typically there is an IT audit team that often comes in and evaluates the systems before the financial statement auditors get there. And they will say, oh, look, IT systems are great. You can rely on what goes in, comes out the other end. Or IT systems are crap. You're going to need to go back to first principles of substantive work. So the evidence mix, as I mentioned before, this is our recipe. In terms of what mix of evidence we need to collect, I need to think about what is the inherent risk. Where there is greater inherent risk, I'm going to do greater substantive testing. All right. What are the internal controls? Where control risk is lower, I'm going to do more controls testing. Oh, I can't spell it. Controls testing. And then I'm also going to look at business cycles. Some business cycles, like payroll, all right, I might not be too worried about the payment of actual employees because there's no actual cash being handled. It's probably more going to be electronic funds transfer. But what I might be interested in payroll is how do I calculate how many hours each person worked? If it's time clocks or something for shift on and shift off, then I might be looking to see if there's any sort of manipulation there. So what cycle, the internal controls and the inherent risk, will influence our recipe? Okay. And just like, and MasterChef is back on, um, and uh, I don't know if you guys know Jamie Fleming, who came forth a couple of seasons ago. I think 12 months ago, he was sitting here in the lecture theatre, same as you. So he came forth on MasterChef and done a whole lot of kitchen work and experience, and then decided that being a chef was actually bloody hard work. So he wants to get into finance and accounting. Um, so he's here finishing off his, I think he should be almost graduating out of his um, business degree. But it's like going on MasterChef and opening the mystery box. Right? Everybody gets the same ingredients in the mystery box, but everybody makes something different. And hopefully, they all taste pretty good. You, you never see any instances where you know, George goes, oh, that's terrible. Um, but there's always going to be a different set of results for every single person in terms of procedures that you design because of what you've seen before, what you've audited before, other clients that you've done before. So how do we design an audit program? The audit program, guys, um, are part of our audit documentation and ASA 230 says that we need to have our audit documentation in order. We need to describe exactly what needs to be done. So typically you'll have a program that says this is the an overall strategy we're going to take for our client and then here are the strategies we're going to take for different parts of the audit because if you've got great controls over sales but poor controls over inventory, you want to customise your approach. All right. So typically our audit risk model, which we look at like this, we will usually do this for each cycle. All right, or, or balance account. Okay, so what are the controls over property, plant, and equipment? 
What are the controls over sales? What are the controls over cash? So that we're not doing excess work. If I found that some areas were very risky, high inherent risk, then I'm going to do more substantive testing there. If I find some parts of the accounts, like um, handling of cash and bank reconciliations, are all done really well, then I might do mostly testing of controls there. All right. Where I can be efficient by testing internal controls, I want to do so. So uh, here's a little diagram that shows us what happens. Understand internal controls. This is the ASA 315 and that pyramid sort of thing. Assess control risk. Look at the cost and benefit of testing controls. Now, this is a really interesting one that we haven't talked about before. But there are some instances in which controls might be great, but I am only going to test substantively. Those sorts of instances are usually where there are low transactions, transaction numbers, all right, high transaction values. Okay, so those are instances in which we might only test substantively. Okay, let's look at real estate purchases. Most companies don't buy a lot of real estate on a regular basis, unless you're a property investment fund. But let's say this, this is manufacturing firm and they buy real estate maybe once every five years. Yes, they've got great internal controls over buying that real estate. Approval processes, documentation, the board has to have a look at information. So you could test the controls, but remember you always have to do some substantive testing. You can't get away with no substantive testing. All right? There will be no audit that is ev only ever controls-based testing. You do some substantive work to cover your butt in case you discover something. So where you have low transaction numbers, like buying real estate, instead of testing all the internal controls around buying that property, you're just going to test the actual purchase of the property. Let's get the contract. Let's look at the bank statement. Let's look at what's recorded within the journal entries um, and test it that way. So sometimes it's not beneficial to test the internal controls where there are low transaction numbers, high transaction values, or high risk items as well. Let me add that. Or high risk items like related party transactions. Um, those are instances where I say, look, don't worry about the controls. Let's look at the actual transactions that need to be done. So if there's a benefit for testing controls, we design them and our substantive tests, considering what procedures, how many, so sample size is how many, what to select, and when to select it. Now, timing is important because audits will tend to do work at two times of year, at the interim and at the after the end of the financial year. An EOFY that you see here is end of financial year. Okay. Now, why might we do some things in terms of uh, timing? Interim is typically March, April, May, June uh, of, the of the financial year, assuming you've got a 30 June year end here. So in the interim, what I can do is I can test internal controls. All right? I can test for three quarters of the year have internal controls been working. I can test transactions like sales um, and expenses for purchases. Have we got three quarters of a year worth of data appropriately recorded? And that means that after the end of the financial year has passed and I've got all of my clients all reporting close together, all I need to do is audit usually the last three to four months of the year and my balances. I can't do anything about accounts receivable or inventory or cash um, until I get to the end of the year. But I can do a lot of interim work testing transactions then. Like stock take, would there be any point in doing a stock take for a 30 June year end in August? No. So I need to pick when is the optimal time and we'll look at that in a lot more detail as we go on. Uh, so I'm gonna go through uh, these are some diagrams which basically just describe what I've been saying in more detail. Okay, hang on. Uh, all right. So, our four phases of the audit. Have a plan, test the internal controls, and then adjust substantive tests if necessary. Do your analytical procedures, and then complete the audit. All right. Now, let's go do some actual examples. So, we've got our phases. Planning, testing, testing. Now, typically, these will be done separately, all right? So they'll be you test your controls, 
And then you may need to adjust your strategy if you find something is going wrong. All right. So if control risk was low, you test the internal controls and you find out even though they were designed well on paper, they don't actually do anything. People can work around the controls. The password safety that's supposed to be on there for internet banking is actually the password is actually written on a post-it note, which I've seen lots of times. You go on to clients and like, oh, who has access to the internet banking? Oh, well, I do and I have the password, but I forget the password a lot. So I write the password on this post-it note and I just stick it on the side of my monitor. And you go, well, that sort of defeats the purpose of having an internal control. Um, so often we will need to adjust our strategy before deciding to come back to our substantive testing. Um, we do our analytical procedures and tests of balances and then complete the audit. And we're going to talk about what happens in completing the audit. Um, there's a few things, like we look at contingent liabilities. Um, we look at going concern. Uh, we look at subsequent events. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit later, two weeks, I think. We get to those sorts of completing the audit things. Um, and issue our audit report, which we already know about. Um, we know I have our types, our unqualified. Audit opinion, we have our modified audit opinions, which include our uh, qualified, our uh, adverse, and our disclaimer of opinion. And added to all of those, I can add my emphasis of matter. Okay, that's not all going to fit. Let's fit that. All right. But we'll, get, we'll come back to reports again. You don't have to worry about that just yet. Okay, so these are not from the textbook. These are practical exercises that I made up this week. Um, so these are all going to be on the video. Um, so don't worry about taking notes if you're worried about losing your spot. Okay, so let's get into some practical stuff, which is the sort of stuff we're going to see in the exam. All right. So designing an audit program or an audit sub-program, you need to consider the assertions and design the procedure to best gather evidence. Now these four rules are the four rules you need to have ingrained into your brain by the time it comes to the exam. Because this is how I mark any procedure written by a student. All right, this is, the, this is I'm giving you the, the key secret here. Um, and we have to do a number of different things. So number one, use the appropriate technical name for a procedure. Are you vouching? Are you tracing? Are you recalculating? Are you doing an analytical procedure? Are you inspecting a document? All right. So choose the most appropriate technical term. And this is important because we are a profession. You are going to be joining the accounting profession and a, signs, you know, indicators of a profession are having our own language. All right. We have our debits and our credits. But we also have our auditing language of assertions and procedures. So it would sort of be like doctors saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, operate on your leg. I'm just going to cut open like the little sticky bit here. And instead of saying, well, we're going to look at this muscle or this bone, all right, a doctor always uses the appropriate terminology. It doesn't just say, oh, look, you've got a problem with your hand. It might be you have a problem with the third blah, 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 blah. I'm not a science person, so I don't know. Any medical science students here? Anyone doing bio? Okay. So what's the name of a bone in my hand? Phalange? All right. So maybe it's like the third one of those. Um, they would be very specific. That's so that if you ever get sued and you've documented your work appropriately, a professional will know, okay, they're using the right terminology. That's the first sign that you know what you're talking about. Number two, use client-specific terms for documents, policies, procedures, and roles or jobs. So the, purchasing, the purchase order in the purchasing department, in one company they might be called purchasing agents. In another company they might be called purchase order officers. In another company they might be called buying agents or procurement agents. So using the right specific client information allows you to go to that client and say, oh, I'd like to speak with the buying agent. And they'll know exactly who you're talking about. If you say, oh, I'd like to go speak to the purchasing agent, they go, well, we don't have those. And you go, oh, okay, maybe I don't need to speak to someone. 
when in fact you've used the wrong terminology. And that's important when you're gathering evidence from your client too. If you ask for something that you think they have but you've used the wrong term for it, they'll do anything they can to get out of giving it to you. Oh, no, we don't have a bill of lading when they have packing slips but they don't tell you, they, you know, if you haven't called it a packing slip, they're not going to give it to you often because they're like, if the auditor can't be bothered to use our word for something, then um, we might, you know, slow the wheels of the audit down in terms of giving them information. So we want client-specific terms. That also means so that if somebody, you know, I win lotto and Bevan comes into the audit to fill in on my spot, he knows exactly what documents to ask of the client without needing to re-interview them and find out what the process is. That leads me on to my third one. Be as detailed as possible. Someone should be able to follow your exact instructions without confusion. And I look for that in the exam. I look to see, is this written in a way that I know exactly what evidence I need to look at, and then on that evidence, what I'm matching or comparing or recalculating or doing. So very specific. That means that the procedures that you often see in the book, like reperform or uh, trace a sales journal entry, trace it to what, vouch it to what. Um, sometimes, and this is, you know, this is the pitfall of open book exams, is that textbooks have very vague procedures, not like the procedures that you actually see at a, a real audit client where they're very detailed. So detailed as possible, and then make sure your procedure is testing the correct control, if your control's testing, or the correct assertion. I know that to test valuation and allocation and accuracy, I need to do some form of mathematical recalculation. If I said, let's test existence by recalculating, I would go, that doesn't match, all right? So this is about having alignment of your objective or your goal for collecting evidence and the evidence. And you might think, well, that sort of sounds, of course that sounds reasonable. Why wouldn't I, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to bake a chocolate cake, why wouldn't I buy eggs, flour, butter, and cocoa powder? I wouldn't be buying fish, cheese, and chives to make a chocolate cake. Um, but students often get quite confused or, or they see a word and they think, oh, I, I know a procedure for this. Always make sure you're aligning what you want to test, a control or um, an assertion with the actual evidence and procedure um, because that's a place where people often go wrong. All right. And sometimes at firms, I found this when I was at um, a big four audit firm, they didn't tell you why you were testing things, why you were gathering evidence. It was just, here's the test, do it, and then document it in the file. And I have a funny story of uh, a former student who went to PwC on an internship, and she was told to document the procedure, collect all the evidence, but she didn't understand assertions. So they didn't explain what the assertions were about. And there was this little tick box where they had letters, E, uh, C, V, um, you know, for existence, rights and obligations, completeness, etc. And she didn't know what they were for, but it wouldn't let her save the work paper until she ticked some boxes. She's like, okay, I'll tick all of them. No, nope, wouldn't, wouldn't let her save it. It knew that this particular procedure needed to match with particular assertions. But she didn't know what the assertions were about, so she just kept clicking on combinations of the boxes until she found one that accepted the actual and said save. She's like, fine, okay, I don't know what that was about, but I just kept clicking until I found an answer. So I don't want you to go into a graduate job feeling like that. I want you to go into those grad jobs knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's really, really important. So I'm going to use the Hardy's wholesaling example that we looked at in our tute last week. And this was one way of drawing the flowchart. It's not the only way. I know Ben drew a flowchart that showed exactly the same things, but in a slightly different layout. But here, let's see if we can identify the internal controls. What are the internal controls? Any ideas? We have a system. So I'm going to just put a little green, I'll highlight these in green. So we have a system that records stuff. 
we know that the purchase order needs to be signed off, but there's also a risk there because you, people within the department can sign it off, so that creates an issue about segregation of duties. When we receive the goods, we complete some paperwork to say this is what we've received. Okay. The accounting department gets the invoice directly from the supplier. That's a control because if I'd sent the invoice back here or over here, they could manipulate it before it gets to the accountant. All right, what other controls do we have? Matching. All right. Okay. Now, let's also highlight things where there are issues. We'll do these sort of in red. All right. So here, we also have an issue. Oh, actually, maybe I'll do this in a pen. Okay. So here we have an issue in that we are lacking segregation of duties. Oops, I couldn't spell duties there. Okay, so we're lacking segregation of duties. And you might notice that a copy of the purchase order goes to the supplier and a purchase order goes to the accounting department, but they don't actually keep a copy of it on file themselves. All right, so that's one other thing there. They sort of need one more copy to go on a file for their own records. Right. It could be in the system, but um, it's, it's always good to have a paper copy. Um, the receiving report, they complete the receiving report. But again, no copy kept on file. So let's put a copy. That's a, another control issue there, one in the file. That's another thing, yes. So the warehouse staff, warehouse staff, whoops, warehouse staff do not know what deliveries to expect. So they might ex accept something that shouldn't be going to the company. All right. So, you know, if I'm at UTS and I've ordered myself a Lamborghini, I'm pretty sure the uh, uh, delivery department would go, I don't think this is meant to be coming from university funds, unless there's some way I could justify it, but I can't. So warehouse staff do not know what deliveries to expect. Um, and quite often, what is a common replacement is that they will get a copy of the purchase order that's been approved, but without the quantities, so that they know what's coming. And when it comes in, they just get the copy of the purchase order. Oh, yep, this is expected. Fill in the quantity and send it in. So let's see. Okay, we've got our file. Uh, our invoice comes. That's fine. There's the matching process. The, the electronic funds for transfer. But again, in this same issue... It was, uh, no, where is that one? Here, again, there's no segregation of duties because anybody from the accounting department could have gone and actually raised the electronic, uh, pressed approve on the fund. So you could, you know, send funds to yourself, which is good for you, not good for the client. Okay. Now, the accounting department should also do one other process at the very end of the month, which we don't have, which is they should also do a bank reconciliation. All right, which means that they would download, uh, that's a manual process there, they would download the uh, bank statement, download the cash journal entries, and then do a bank reconciliation, and that's not being done. So here I've analysed our process there. So we could, here are things that we could test. All right. I'm going to write a procedure for just one of them, checking that the documents match. But look, if our system had controls like you can't order goods that are not in stock, um, you can't go above a certain credit limit, we could test those as well. But I'm going to test this one here about the documents. Okay, so I'm going to write a control then. You have to bear with me while I'm typing here. All right, so control is matching of uh, purchase order, receiving report, and invoice by the accounting department. Okay. Uh, let me just minimize that. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so we've got our procedure there. Oh, sorry, our control. So how would I test that? What would I need to look at? Those documents, yep. And it's, this is never rocket science. All right, so people think auditing is really, really tough and really, really difficult, but as long as you know what's going on here, designing a test is actually really quite simple. So we want to obtain samples of those documents, but, and I don't know how they're filed. One way I might do it is I might select a sample of cash payments and vouch to, because I'm starting at the cash payment, I'm going backwards to the document. So I'm using the right term, vouch to purchase order, receiving report and invoice, examine for evidence of staff conducting the match. All right, now that could sometimes be something as simple as, and I know in some companies, they actually have a stamp, which before you can process the payment, they stamp like a cover sheet, and it says purchase order matches receiving report, and there's a little checkbox, tick. Purchase order you know, matches sales invoice, tick. Uh, receiving report matches sales invoice, tick. And then that person has to sign. So there usually is something, either a cover page or something on there that has proof that they've actually done it. Because if you've done it by just looking at them and you don't document anything, there's no proof it's been done. Okay? So I'd select a sample of those payments, vouch them back to make sure that there is documentation that matches. Yeah? For evidence of staff conducting the match. Is there a signature? Let me just add a bit. E.g. signature or stamp. Now, in companies that are not Hardy's wholesaling, where they have lack of segregation of duties in regards to the cash payment, typically the accountant prepares those three sets of documents. And those three sets of documents are usually called a voucher package. All right, so the voucher package contains usually your uh, purchase order, oops, your receiving report, and your invoice. Um, and quite common is that the accountant pulls all those documents together, puts a cover sheet down or puts a stamp on it that says that they've matched. And then before the payment is made, whoever is authorised to make the payment, like the CFO or a second party, so quite often you need two authorizations to make a payment, they'll also check the voucher package and do their own little signature or something to say that two people have checked it. Okay, how are we doing so far? Everybody still with me? You're not asleep yet, so that's a good sign. Okay, so what do they tell us about substantive testing? We know that there were some areas that we found had weaknesses, that anybody could sign off the purchase order, that anybody could make the cash payment, all right? Um, that there was no file, so there's no file here of those ones. Again, there was no file here, there. We don't know much about the purchase order system, uh, but we could follow up about that. But the key ones, in terms of what I'm really worried about, is this one and this one. All right, because people could buy stuff for their own purposes. Um, so, you know, I could order 100 sausages, not that, you know, I need sausages to teach auditing. Um, or I could order, you know, something really ridiculous, like a concrete mixer truck, or, you know, something um, that's not related to the firm. And there's the possibility that the accounting department could have funds transfers that are not properly approved. Okay, so. How would we test those? Any ideas? How would, could we check if the company was buying stuff that maybe they didn't need? The only way in which you can do some of these things is by downloading all of the purchase order data and then looking for unusual supplier names, because right? there's no approved list of suppliers for this particular company. Can you look at the list? You could look at the bank statements, but that only the wastage. Wastage. wastage, potentially. 
So if you're manufacturing something and you think you might be buying a lower quality product that could be resulting in more wastage in manufacturing, yep, that's absolutely the case. Um, you might look at supplier names. Uh, we once found a fraud where people were creating fake suppliers and there was collusion between purchasing and accounting for services. Um, purchasing department was creating fake suppliers. These guys were approving fake invoices. Um, and what happened was it was discovered because the companies that were fake had the same postal addresses as some employees. Now, most people are smart enough, if you're going to create a fake supplier, you buy a per post office box somewhere. Um, and, you know, you buy it two or three suburbs away from the suburb in which you live. That's not, a, not giving fraud suggestions. Um, but, you know, if you're a smart criminal, You'd create a fake purchase or a fake supplier way away from where you live, you know, not in the same suburb, not the next street over, don't use your neighbor's address. So I'd need to scan my purchase orders there and I'd look for items that look unusual. Um, quite often when I'm looking through expenses at a client, especially in their entertainment expense, you look at the sort of stuff that goes in there. Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, fancy lunches at gentlemen's clubs are not really business appropriate expenses um, that you should be claiming. But what about for these electronic funds? How could we check if there was any money that was stolen and not paid to real suppliers? We could try and look at the bank statement and then trace them, yeah? Um, again, we could try and match back um, payments to these documents. Because theoretically, accounting could make a payment without any of this. They could just put a payment in and go, done. So if I could find payments that don't have any documentation, those could also be fraudulent transactions in place. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay, I've got five minutes before we need to start packing up and letting um, our next lecturer in. So now we're gonna do a live design example for substantive testing, I'll just write up here substantive so that you know that that's what it's about. Oh, wrong color on the pen. Ah, oh, okay, that's why. Substantive. All right, so we're gonna do a live example for sales. So I am gonna get somebody to pick a company for me. Cat, pick me a company, any company, one that you know. One that everybody else would know as well, so don't pick something terribly obscure and tiny. <laughs> She's thinking hard. Pick something. Yes. Qantas, all right. You'll actually see Qantas on my... Um, you'll actually see Qantas on one of my videos, and you've probably looked at Qantas in some of your other subjects as well. Okay, so Qantas, how are we going to prove that sales really did happen? Any ideas? What's the procedure that we most use for occurrence? Vouching, yes, okay. So I'm going to start by vouching a sample of sales journal entries to what? How are we going to have proof that customers really got on planes and went places? Yes. To electronic records of boarding passes scanned at the gate. Because you can get a boarding pass, but you can decide not to get on. All right. So if I found a sample of those, that a sample scanned at gate, to ensure passenger did board flight. Oh, so is revenue still earned if they don't show up? And this is where we need to go into their specific revenue recognition policies. Because if you've got your boarding pass, depending on the type of ticket you've got, some tickets can be changed after boarding passes have been issued and delayed to another time. Others, like the super cheap fares that you might get $99 to somewhere, 
are non-refundable, non-changeable, nothing. So in those instances, should we record the revenue exactly at the time of sale or at the time the person is supposed to get on the plane? Those are bigger issues that would actually go towards the presentation and disclosure and calculating um, the balance of sales as well. Yeah, but definitely something we would think about. Okay, how am I going to check that the amount of money we've recorded for the sale of that ticket is the correct amount? There's, a, there's something, we have a purchase order, but it's not called a purchase order. Well, this is Qantas, right? So who's booked a Qantas ticket recently? Me. So when you go online, you buy your ticket, what do you get? You get your little itinerary, and then you get something else. Receipt. Okay, so let's vouch a sample of sales journal entries to receipts issued to customers and recalculate ticket price. Hang on, let's put a comma in there. Recalculate ticket price and match to journal. Now that's relatively easy for sales in Australian dollars. All right, that becomes more complicated when we start thinking about sales in US dollars, Fiji dollars, um, New Zealand dollars, um, the Chinese currencies, Tokyo, uh, wherever you might be, it's going to become more difficult. But same basic principle. Now, if you have to worry about foreign currency translation, then you need to think about, well, how is Qantas handling foreign currency, especially for purchases? Uh, for, sorry, for sales. Do we have some arrangement on foreign currency rates? Do we fix rates in? How does that work? So accuracy gets more complicated the more complicated the ticket purchase becomes. Completeness. How am I going to make sure that all of my sales are recorded? The passenger statements? Okay. So this could be an analytical procedure. Even. So let's write analytical procedure. Uh, obtain data on number of passengers on flights. Whoops, I can't spell. On flights over the period and recalculate uh, sales to determine if amount matches recorded sales. Now, I know that this is very simplistic because this doesn't take into, the, into account the fact that you could have different people on the same plane who've paid different prices. Right? I booked 12 months ago, I might have paid $1,800, but I booked on a special, I paid $699. So there is some issues there, certainly, about uh, using the analytic, but it could give you an overview. I'm actually going to make another one. I could trace a sample of itineraries. Can I spell itinerary? Itineraries to uh, boarding passes and journal entries. And tracing is our more standard um, process here. So let me try and make enough room to shrink both of these in. Yeah. There you go. Now you've got two there. Okay. Cut off. When should cut off be? And this is where it gets tricky, right? Because now you're selling tickets all around the world in all sorts of different time zones. And midnight here on the end of the financial year is not going to be midnight everywhere. So how are we going to check cutoff? Gather a sample of sales made within 24 hours of end of financial year. Actually, let me adjust that. Made before and after. 
And we could probably narrow that window down too to probably about six hours on either side of the end of financial year. Ensure journal entries recorded in correct financial year. All right. And that's going to be tricky because you cross so many time zones, you need to make sure you know exactly when the end of the financial year is. Okay, and then classification. Again, this is going to be lots of looking at documentation. Check that when tickets are purchased, uh, journal entry records unearned revenue until passenger takes flight. All right, because we know theoretically it should be unearned revenue at that point. And then when they make the flight, there should be the uh, journal entry that says, okay, now these are going into our actual revenue stream. Okay, so here are my, some examples where I've gone through, I've used the technical terms, I've used uh, hopefully client related information, so they have, we have receipts and itineraries, and I've got a procedure for every single assertion. Now, if I thought one assertion was at greater risk than another, I might use more than one procedure as well. Or if I thought that there was a control risk around accuracy, I might have a bigger sample or do more than one sort of test. Any questions? Are we all feeling thoroughly overwhelmed? Okay, we'll have lots of practice at this, so don't worry. Um, and there'll be lots of videos where you can watch me go through examples as well. So thanks very much everybody this week, and I will see you all next week where we only have three weeks to go.